Okay, good morning and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you this morning on the initial management of traumatic brain injury. Uh, okay, so why is this important? Well, a publication from the largest European trauma registry has shown that 60% of all deaths in patients who reach hospital alive after major trauma occur in the context of traumatic brain injury. And these hospital deaths result from secondary brain injury because the patient is alive when they reach hospital. So the primary traumatic brain injury has not killed them. Time critical interventions reduce secondary brain injury deaths. How do we know this? Well, we know this from two types of research, high quality basic science research and also some high quality trauma epidemiology. So looking at the basic science research, this comes from Marek Chesnicka and colleagues at the University of Cambridge. We know that the brain needs blood flow of between of about 50 mils per minute per 100 grams of brain tissue. And the brain autoregulates, a healthy brain autoregulates between a cerebral perfusion pressure of 50 and 100 millimeters of mercury, which is line A on this graph. This zone of autoregulation <coughs> is altered after traumatic brain injury. Line B shows a zone of autoregulation of optimal cerebral blood flow of between 75 and 150 millimeters of mercury. But after traumatic brain injury, we can also see line C where autoregulation is lost and there is direct correlation between cerebral blood flow and cerebral perfusion pressure. But essentially, after traumatic brain injury, we definitely do not want to have a cerebral perfusion pressure of less than 55, 50 millimeters of mercury, and preferably above 75 millimeters of mercury. Just struggling to get the slide to move forward. So we know that cerebral perfusion pressure is the product of subtracting intracranial pressure from the mean arterial pressure. But when we are managing a, tra a trauma patient at the scene, we don't know what the patient's intracranial pressure is. And we have to assume therefore, that it's at least 20 millimeters of mercury when the patient has a severe traumatic brain injury and a Glasgow Coma score of less than nine. So we therefore need a mean arterial pressure of at least 70 millimetres of mercury to generate our optimal cerebral perfusion pressure to generate the zone of autoregulation and avoid secondary brain injury. And we also know this from high quality trauma epidemiology research. So this is a study of 5,000 patients from the Trauma Order and Research Network with a traumatic brain injury on CT brain scan. And you can see that the optimal systolic blood pressure which where there is a correlation with mean arterial pressure is between 120 and 140 millimeters of mercury. Similar to stroke on either side of this, there is a U-shaped graph, <clears throat> but the real injury, secondary brain injury occurs with low systolic blood pressures. So the purple triangles show the risk adjusted odds of death adjusted for age and uh, intracranial injury. And you can see that particularly below systolic blood pressures of 90 millimeters of mercury, there is a really significant increase in the risk adjusted odds of death. High blood pressures also look like they are bad news, but in fact, this is an artifact of age. And once you adjust for patient age and intracranial injury, it's only the really high blood pressures associated with coning that are bad news for the traumatic brain injury patient. This observation was also confirmed in the impact study by Andrew Mars and colleagues in 2007 that identified the independent predictors of outcome after traumatic brain injury. Being mainly things that we can't do very much about as clinicians in the pre-hospital environment, such as age, Glasgow coma score, CT findings and pupils, but hypoxia and hypotension we can do something about, and these will prevent secondary brain injury if we can reduce them. Similarly, again, a large study from Tarn in 2012 showed that age, Glasgow coma score, pupils, the injury severity score, and CT findings were important independent predictors of hospital mortality, as were hypoxia and hypotension. <clears throat> 
So if we look at a typical patient with a traumatic brain injury, this uh, intracranial injury here, contusion and uh, intracranial bleeding in the right temporal region, if we can get sufficient oxygenated blood to this ischemic penumbra here, this will reduce secondary brain injury. <clears throat> Similarly, if we identify the extradural hematoma early on and involve the neurosurgeons and take the patient to theatre, again, we're going to reduce secondary brain injury. So what life-saving interventions do we have in our armory in the pre-hospital environment and the emergency department to reduce secondary brain injury? Again, here's a study from TAN, the Trauma Order and Research Network, which looked at the frequency with which life-saving interventions were performed in trauma patients. And the ones coloured in red here will support the uh, mean arterial pressure, and those in white here will reduce intracranial pressure. However, in the pre-hospital environment, we have to bear in mind that these life-saving interventions are often invasive and carry risks, and they're more likely to be of benefit if the injured patient in the pre-hospital environment does actually have a potentially life-changing injury. And these TBI-specific interventions are targeted towards patients with an intracranial injury on the CT scan. So how well do these interventions actually work? Well, if we look, first of all, at pre-hospital rapid sequence intubation, we know that for patients GCS less than nine, particularly after a high energy impact, they are highly likely to have intracranial and or life-changing injury. The randomized trial from Bernard et al, now 10 years old, suggests a better functional status if the rapid sequence intubation is performed in the pre-hospital environment rather than waiting until the patient reaches the emergency department. And so where I practice in the English NHS, our major trauma guideline now says that all major trauma patients with a GCS of less than nine should have an RSI within 45 minutes of the 999 or 112 call. This could be done at the scene of injury, but if this isn't possible, if it's just a paramedic crew, then the emphasis should be on getting the patient to hospital for an RSI as soon as possible. What about interventions to expedite neurosurgery? bypassing the nearest hospital for a more distant neuroscience centre in head injured adults with suspected traumatic brain injury. We conducted the HITS NS trial, the head injury transportation straight to neurosurgery, a pilot cluster feasibility randomised control trial. In the first 300 patients, we did not see improved outcomes in the intervention group. In fact, we saw improved outcomes in the control group, but the difference was small. This meant that it wasn't going to be feasible to do a randomized trial of 4,000 patients because the event rate was too small. Similarly, another intervention that could result in early reduction of intracranial pressure was the RAL trial published in JAMA last year in patients with suspected traumatic brain injury, GCS less than 13. These are patients without shock with moderate to severe traumatic brain injury and out of hospital tranexamic acid within two hours of injury compared with placebo, did not significantly improve six month neurologic outcome as measured by the extended Glasgow outcome scale. So what's the problem with bypass and tranexamic acid in isolated traumatic brain injury? Why is it not working for reducing uh, intracranial pressure and improving outcomes in these TBI patients? The problem is that we don't know whether or not the patients have a brain injury or not. And the moderate Glasgow Coma Scale of 9 to 12 or 9 to 13 lacks specificity for the diagnosis of TBI on CT brain scan. So in the bypass trial, the median GCS was 12, but subsequently only 25% had intracranial injury on CT brain scan and only 7% required neurosurgery, which meant that for every uh, one patient being conveyed to a distant neuroscience centre, Another 12 were conveyed that didn't require neurosurgery, diluting the effect of early neurosurgery. In the RAL trial of tranexamic acid in TBI patients without shock, the mean GCS was 7.6, but subsequently 40% were shown not to have an in, uh, intracranial injury on CT brain scan. In both these, these trials, intoxication was a major confounder in both patients, both groups of patients. And there is another problem in the pre-hospital environment. Again, this is a study from TARN, looking at all traumatic brain injury patients 
Uh, it's five years old now, but it showed some very useful evidence for how the epidemiology of traumatic brain injury is changing. And this graph shows you the age of traumatic brain injury patients on the TARN database and the mechanism of injury. And you can see that older fallers are becoming the increasingly dominant cohort. Further research from TARN has shown that these older fallers present with a high Glasgow coma score after traumatic brain injury. When they're compared with single injury patients who are younger, their mean GCS is consistently one to three points higher at the scene of injury. And this applies to patients with the same severity of traumatic brain injury, the same type of traumatic brain injury, and the same mechanism of injury. So what we see in the pre-hospital environment is for every 100 patients with a head injury, only five will subsequently have a traumatic brain injury on CT brain scan. But our current triage characteristics using a GCS of 12 or less are only going to identify two out of those five patients and will also have false positives of another four to six patients who are intoxicated. What we really could do with is a pre-hospital biomarker for traumatic brain injury to target our pre-hospital TBI interventions. At the moment, we don't have a reliable blood biomarker. You can bring the CT scan to the patient, but this is expensive and logistically complicated. Uh, but we're perhaps close to some breakthroughs of blood biomarkers in these patients. So what happens when the patient with traumatic brain injury reaches the emergency department? Well, again, we don't really know exactly what is going on inside the patient's brain. We have an unconscious patient with an impaired Glasgow coma scale or amnesia for the event. And there are multiple causes in addition to primary traumatic brain injury. There may, may be no TBI, but an evolving secondary injury from hypoxia or hypotension. The patient may be intoxicated. There may be postictal. There may be pre-existing cognitive impairment or acute medical events such as infection and dysrhythmia, which commonly cause falls in older people preceding a brain injury or any combination of the above factors. This is all quite complicated but we have to take the approach that any injured patient with a Glasgow coma score of less than 15 or amnesia associated with injury has a primary traumatic brain injury until proven otherwise, even if they have no external signs of head injury. So again, we need to focus on the prevention of secondary brain injury by preventing and treating hypoxia and hypotension. When the patient arrives in the emergency department, commonly now they'll arrive on a scoop stretcher this often has a solstice in it here, and it's possible to miss the fact that there is a lot of bleeding from occipital laceration, particularly in older anticoagulated patients. So we need to take our C-ABC approach, controlling catastrophic hemorrhage first, and make sure we don't miss these bleeding occipital scalp wounds. We've talked about the importance of early drug-assisted intubation supported by a randomised trial. And then early tranexamic acid is important when the patient is suspected to have extracranial bleeding. Pelvic slings for possible pelvic fracture are important, and we really need to be vigilant for extracranial bleeding, which could rapidly lower the patient's blood pressure. So again, we need to do our early blood gases, look at the patient's lactate, hemoglobin, rotem, and an early pan-CT to make sure we diagnose all those extracranial injuries that can cause hypotension particularly in patients with a GCS less than 15 after high energy blunt trauma. If the patient is bleeding, we need to move quickly to our major hemorrhage protocols, damage control surgery, and in older patients, early reversal of anticoagulation. And we need to be very careful with hypotensive resuscitation, as my earlier slides have shown that it puts patients with traumatic brain injury at risk. For the other side of the CPP equation, intravenous mannitol hypotonic saline can be used if the pupil is blown before CT brain scan. And then if the CT scan shows an expanding intracranial hematoma, we know that we need a prompt CT, neurosurgery and neurocritical care. Should we be given tranexamic acid to patients where we don't suspect extracranial bleeding, but we solely suspect intracranial bleeding? Here are the results of the recent CRASH-3 trial. They are consistent with a mild effect or no effect at all. Uh, and these currently remain controversial. I don't propose to go into them here, um, but I'm currently on the uh, NICE, NICE guideline committee and we'll be making some recommendations in 2022. 
So which of these unconscious trauma patients should we do a CT scan? Uh, this is the algorithm for early CT scan that we use in the UK. Uh, again, identifying unconscious trauma patients with head injury, high risk factors need to get to scan within an hour. If the patient reaches GCS 15 within two hours of injury, we have a bit more time. What do patients look like after the CT brain scan? Well, we know a lot more about this now, thanks to the European Centre TBI study in 65 centres and in, uh, in 18 countries. The Centre TBI registry of 22,000 patients has now identified that we can divide the traumatic brain injury cohort into two, those with low energy and high energy TBI. Those with low energy injured through low energy falls are older, they're 74 years old, half of them are taking anticoagulant or antiplatelet medication, and this represents 40% of the TBI cohort admitted to hospital. High energy patients are much younger, age 42, um, are more likely to be male and less likely to be taking pre-existing anticoagulant or antiplatelet medication. It may surprise you to learn that the rates of CT abnormality in these patients are equivalent. So in patients discharged from the emergency room, 6% of, of low energy and 4% of high energy have a brain injury. 36% of those admitted with low energy have a CT brain scan. And 34% of those with high energy admitted have a CT brain scan. 87% of low energy in the ITU have a CT brain scan and 70% of high energy have an abnormality on CT brain scan. It may also surprise you to learn that the mortality rates are higher in low energy patients. So 4.2% of patients with brain injury admitted to the ward after low energy trauma will die, whereas only 1% of those admitted after high energy trauma. 22% of low energy admitted to the ICU will die, as opposed to only 16% with high energy. However, so what we see in this slide is low energy patients are discriminated against. Only one in five of those admitted to hospital will get critical care despite them having a higher risk of death. Whereas two out of five of those with high energy will be admitted to critical care. So if we're thinking about TBI patients in Europe, we now see two major cohorts, older patients injured by low energy trauma and younger patients injured by high energy trauma. The low energy cohort is growing. They're demographically distinct. They're often on pre-existing anticoagulant, antiplatelet medication, which maybe need to be reversed prior to surgery. But importantly, energy transfer does not differentiate the risk of intracranial injury and ward and ICU hospital mortality is higher in the low energy cohort. And we have published this recently in PLOS Medicine. The low energy cohort are 50% less likely to receive critical care, and this needs to be studied in terms of appropriateness in further research. So to summarize, the goal of the initial management of patients with suspected or actual traumatic brain injury is to reduce secondary brain injury by reducing hypoxia and hypotension, but also to have a holistic approach to patient care. As you don't know exactly what's going on in the patient's brain at the scene of injury in the emergency department, we need to assume all patients have a primary brain injury if they have an impaired GCS or amnesia after injury until we have a negative CT scan. The approach is CABC and early imaging for all with risk factors. We need to be aware of acute and pre-existing medical conditions and anticoagulation. And a multidisciplinary approach is needed for all patients with TBI, particularly the low energy co cohort with complex mild TBI and pre-existing medical conditions. Thank you for your attention. And if there's time, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Fiona. We have a few minutes for discussion and for some questions. I have uh, in the chat two questions so far. The first one is for Pierre. Uh, Pierre, which is the vasopressor of choice for you? Probably, I, I suppose, when you have to, to manage hypotensive events in patients with acute skin stroke. Yes, so the, the vasopressor we use is norepinephrine because it seems, uh, it seems logical because when you use general anesthesia, you, you decrease the sympathetic uh, reaction of uh, 
um, you increase the sympathetic reaction. So we have to use patient um, drug with an alpha mechanism. So norepinephrine is the best, and we recommend to to start the norepinephrine as soon as we start the general anesthesia to avoid a, um, a zone where you only have the general anesthesia without the vasopressor. We begin the vasopressor very early when you, we start the general anesthesia. Okay, perfect. And uh, on the other way around, uh, which is the antihypertensive of choice in your institution? for the management of blood pressure. Very often these patients arrive and they have a high blood pressure. How do you manage it? Uh, we, we manage it using, we, we can use both, but the, the, probably the, the, the use of anticalcic, uh, we use anticalcic drug. Uh, this is a, probably the, the way we manage uh, uh, hypertension in, in my center. We can also use beta blockers, but uh, usually we prefer uh, anticalcic. Okay, well, in any case, uh, the guidelines do not provide specific indication on which is the, the best one. So it's probably more related to uh, specific center factors. Uh, still, Pierre, um, management of uh, patients with uh, stroke who go for uh, mechanical thrombectomy, do you intubate every time for general anesthesia or do you consider an LMA, for example, of second generation like IGEL or Procil, even though the patient may not be fasted for more than six hours? So in my center, we, we intubate everybody. So we don't use uh, the other device. Um, all these patients uh, uh, have no fast. So you, you should probably use intubation, I think. The, the other thing is whether you use cancer sedation or not. In my center, we are very keen on for general anesthesia, but I know that some centers also use cancer sedation with no protection for the airway. So I think it's more dependent on the patient. So, so it depends on the uh, severity of the symptoms. It depends on the occlusion that you see. When you have uh, large symptoms, large occlusion, um, high symptoms with large occlusion. So I think that patients should be intubated because the risk of uh, uh, aspiration is very high. So usually we intubate the patient. We, we don't use the other device. Sounds uh, reasonable. Uh, now I have a question, some questions for Fiona. Um, I think it's worth it to clarify what you meant regarding uh, the administration of tranexamic acid because uh, I have a question here which uh, someone is asking, is TBI a contraindication to administer tranexamic acid? So I think it will be worth it to, um, to tell us your point of view about mm -hmm. the tranexamic acid in polytrauma and isolated TBI. Yeah. So I think the evidence is much clearer in the polytrauma patient with suspected extracranial bleeding from the CRASH-2 trial. I, I don't think that is controversial that we should be giving tranexamic acid, providing we see these patients within three hours of injury. Um, and in my practice, our recommendation is that we do the same as the CRASH-2 trial. So we give one, one gram bolus and then start a one gram infusion, and that can be started at the scene of injury. Uh, when you're not suspecting extracranial bleeding, but you are suspecting intracranial bleeding, so patient with a, um, a, an impaired GCS, then I think the evidence from CRASH-3 is much more controversial. Um, the result was, if you go back to my slide, I think the overall, for all patients with all GCS, the relative risk was 0.94. Um, and it was suggested to be uh, 1.0 in patients with severe TBI. But in fact, there are quite significant differences by country. So CRASH-3, there was a lot of recruitment from low middle income countries. Um, in high income countries, I think the potential for tranexamic acid to, to be of benefit in patients with TBI who have a low GCS is, is probably reasonable. Um, but uh, we are considering the evidence carefully from CRASH-3 and from RAL in the NICE head injury guideline, and we'll be making some recommendations next year. So at the moment, I think there's no clear guidance in isolated TBI. Um, but my feeling, my personal practice is that I would give it um, in patients with a GCS less than 12 and brain injury in a high income setting, because I think what happened in the low income setting uh, was that a lot of patients who were injured more than three hours ago were recruited into the trial. 
because there's no ambulance service there. So it was more difficult for the recruiters to tell the precise time of injury. So um, yeah, I think clearly in polytrauma patient with TBI, give tranexamic acid within three hours of injury. In patients with isolated injury, it's more controversial, but I believe it's likely to be of benefit in patients with a GCS of 12 or less. Okay, that, that's very clear now, thank you. And uh, the other question is uh, uh, the management of the patients who, who arrive, and now the number of these patients is increasing, uh, who arrive at our attention uh, under the new anticoagulant drugs. Mm. So how do you manage these patients? Uh, uh, do you um, call the hematologist or do you have a protocol yourself uh, to, to yeah. manage? Uh, yeah, we, we have... We, we have a protocol um, so we are for the for the DOAX we we are using uh, bariplex or prothrombin complex um, and also we actually use tranexamic acid in these patients also um, and then there are specific agents for some of the specific DOAX that have been um, brought into play as well so uh, so again this is this is very important but and I think this is one of the frontiers in traumatic brain injury because Traumatic brain injury as a disease is getting older and older and more and more patients are taking DOAX. So we are, we are going to see uh, more and more patients coming in. Um, so I think there'll be better evidence again with specific agents for specific DOAX as the randomized control trials come to the fore. Um, but I think it's important that we, we have a protocol to, to control bleeding in these patients. And another important area is in antiplatelet drugs. The evidence is not clear in antiplatelet drugs. The, the patch trial, was negative in spontaneous subarachnoid bleeding uh, and it's not clear in traumatic brain injury in patients with antiplatelet drugs whether or not um, these will uh, these will work reverse or whether or not they can be reversed with uh, with is platelets it, yeah. but it is something that you do reversal of uh, antiplatelet drugs uh, it's not something that i do personally um, i let the neurosurgeons make the decision um, our neurosurgeons like to give platelet drugs but we've done a, we've recently published a survey in the emergency medical journal and there's a lot of variation in practice even within neurosurgeons but across the specialty groups so yeah okay. thank you i think we have time for one more question because we have one minute left uh, sorry i have to choose between many uh, this is for Pierre. Someone is saying, uh, um, please clarify, in successful thrombectomy, blood pressure goal is about 100 and 125 millimeter of mercury. What systolic blood pressure uh, should we achieve in patients with not uh, a complete thrombectomy? How to get this information in the ICU team? So the, the problem is when you have an unsuccessful uh, reperfusion, uh, the pronostic of the patient is very poor, so we, we should be keep in mind that uh, that first. So we have to 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 have a clear benefit uh, harm balance between uh, admitting the patient to the ICU or not first, because patient with no reperfusion sometimes will die. The other thing is if the patient has no uh, large uh, high symptoms. Maintaining high blood pressure is recommended, and probably if you have an unsuccessful blood perfusion, you can uh, keep the, the systolic active blood pressure target uh, similar to uh, before the reperfusion, meaning between 140 and 108. I think this is reasonable. But the problem is some patient is going to have a really poor neurological outcome, and the risk-benefit balance is not clear whether we should admit the patient to the ICU or not. Yeah, in fact, even in this case, uh, we we did a survey with the European Society of Intensive Care and there was a huge variability regarding the criteria. Uh, in some centers, it was uh, just a neurological, uh, just a, a neuroimaging criteria. Uh, in some others, it was a combination of many factors. So we, we definitely need uh, more, more guidelines. Um, well, I think we are running late, so I'm really sorry to conclude this uh, very interesting session. I really would like to thank the two speakers, uh, Pierre and Fiona. You gave uh, two excellent talks uh, and uh, uh, the questions are many and uh, unfortunately for the sake of time, uh, we had to limit the dis discussion to, to 10, 15 minutes. But thank you very much and uh, I, I would like to uh, 
um, wish you a great day uh, and at uh, your anesthesia and at the Congress. And uh, I'll see you later on in, uh, in the afternoon for more session together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.